bless you for this wonderful opportunity to come and share my heart with you this morning. Roger, my husband, and I live in a charming old farmhouse, and many of you have actually been to have tea or meals with us there. And as you know, it's surrounded by fields all around, of different crops growing. So I've had the joy over the years to watch little sprouts coming up, growing, sometimes wheat, barley, rapeseed, and then the harvesting. And it's now the harvest season. And what's amazing is that before, it used to be the old farmer plowing up and down, but now it's these huge combine harvesters, and ladies drive them too, which is great. And they go up and down with amazing precision because it's all computer controlled, and um, sometimes drones are used, so it's high tech. But it's fascinating to see the change of the seasons. But then inside of our garden, we've got an old apple and pear tree and a very reluctant plum tree. But the apple and pear trees are old and gnarled, but they still keep producing so much fruit. And this summer, our two little granddaughters, twins of eight years old, and I have been climbing the trees and picking the fruit, baskets full of apples and pears. And it's been a thrill to cut those fruits open and see the amazing perfection of the seeds inside. Now, I know the computer-generated harvester does this incredible precision, but the way the pattern of seeds is formed inside the fruit is just a thrill. Do you know how many seeds are in an average apple? Well, a Granny Smith has got 26 seeds. Um, a Golden Delicious, or a Red Delicious, has nine. And a Gala Apple is 10. So it goes, but isn't it amazing that each kind has its own pattern and its own number of seeds? It's astounding. And if you plant a pip, you don't just get another apple, but you get a whole tree full of apples that each have pips and more. Abundance is just written into the DNA. And this has been a summer of lots of lovely salads, and you cut open a tomato, and if you've seen the pattern, it's almost like a tree of life inside a tomato. And an average tomato, how many? 300 pips. Isn't that amazing? 300. So you plant a tomato, and just think of all the abundance. It's amazing. So after I was just thinking about this and researching, I went to the supermarket and had a punnet of tomatoes in my hand waiting to check out. And I thought, in this little punnet of 100 grams, 27,000 seeds. Isn't that astounding? So we are wired. We are created for abundance in everything. It's been a time of barbecues, corn on the cob, 800 pips in 16 rows. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and we haven't even got to the watermelons yet. <laughs> so watermelons also about 800 pips. And I just always bless the dear people in these research laboratories who are counting pips. <laughs> and what about pomegranates? Well, that is phenomenal. We won't have to go there, but in one pomegranate, 1,370. I didn't personally count them. But <laughs> so it's amazing. So you get the message. Abundance. It's abundance. That's what's in a seed. And to me, what's a thrill is that the miracle of the seed is that it's encapsulated in this tiny little dot. And it's the master of everything in the DNA of that seed that has the capacity to grow into that particular fruit or crop. So you look at this tiny little seed, and it grows not into just another fruit, but into a tree or a bush to produce myriads. God is a God of abundance. And so, of course, as we're talking about the parables, you guessed it. <laughs> it's the parable of the sower. And I've called this talk God's abundance, and it's available to us. It really is. But how many of us tap into that abundance? The miracle of the seed, just remember that, 
encapsulates all the magnificence of the taste, the color, the texture, the fragrance. It's absolutely wrapped up in what looks like a dry, dead husk. But given the right conditions, it starts to grow. And the roots become shoots, and the shoots become fruits. I'm going to re repeat that. The roots become shoots, and the shoots become fruits. But it starts with that seed, with all that locked up potential, being in the right condition to make it grow. Over the weeks, we've listened to amazing sermons by all these lovely gifted speakers. We've had Trevor talk about the wise and foolish builder. We've had Chris give a sermon that really struck deep to me when the Good Samaritan we had Mark talking about the lost coin, Heather talking about be the light, which is just amazing. If you've missed them, catch up. But it's interesting that today's sermon on the parable of the sower, Jesus said these words about the parable of the sower. Mark chapter 4, verse 13. Do you not discern and understand this parable, the sower? How then is it possible for you to discern and understand all the parables? This is a key parable. And it's interesting that it's the last one because this is the essence of all the parables and I'll be unpacking why. So I ask you to bear with me as we dig a little deeper. Sorry about that, it's a very weak one. <laughs> but... <laughs> Basically, what I would love to share with you is why did Jesus say that? Why is this such a significant and key parable? It's actually mentioned in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. It's in Matthew chapter 13, 1 to 23. It's in Mark chapter 4, 1 to 20. And it's also in Luke chapter 8, 1 to 12. All of them mention this parable. And it's so interesting that Jesus actually explains it, because he didn't always do that. It's key, it's vital, it's important that you get this, that I get this. And not just that we get it here, but that we get it here, and that we receive it and live it. John's gospel doesn't have any parables. But this parable, the sower, is rimful in the Gospel of John. <laughs> and I'll be showing you a little bit later. The Gospel of John is throbbing with this parable. It's so exciting. I love it. <laughs> so why did Jesus use parables? We've gone through that. Parabole, it's a comparison. And Jesus liked to provoke his audience. He was a master storyteller. He could hold hundreds, thousands of people's attention in days without the Light speakers and the big mics, because of who he was, the presence, the authority that he had, he could hold their attention because he didn't just give earthly stories like the parables, but they had a, a heavenly meaning. That's what this is about. Everyday things that people really knew about, they didn't know about the combine harvesters and the drones and the technology and the app on your mobile. But they saw sowers, they saw people in seeds, fields, and that's what Jesus speaks about, the parable of the sower. Let's read it together. Mark chapter 4, 1 to 8, from the New International Version. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat down in it on the lake while the people were along the shore at the water's edge. You could just imagine that, crowds pressing right along the water's edge, and Jesus sat down in the boat. In those days, the rabbi always sat down to give his teaching. So it's, it's amazing, that's what Jesus did. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, listen. And when Jesus says, listen, we listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places, 
where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Remember what I said about roots? Become shoots and shoots become fruit. Without roots, bad news. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up, grew, produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. We talked about the abundance, and there it is. Well, I love this story of the parable, but so much of what Jesus has taught in the past in the Bible, we might have learned at Sunday school or at children's church or somewhere in our past. So when we hear these very familiar words, we think, oh, hum, you know, I kind of know it, just secretly. I mean, you wouldn't admit that. <laughs> you kind of think you know it. Well, I'm hoping that as we dig down and look very carefully at some of these aspects, that there will be a new revelation for you. I really do. Because I'm going to be asking you a very deep and a very personal question at the end of my talk that only you will be able to answer. And I say this lovingly to you. Listen. Because there were many in that group with Jesus who just casually listened didn't take things too seriously, and they missed it altogether. But there were those who were intentional, who sat and soaked in every word, and their lives were changed forever. Something happened because they allowed what Jesus said, the truth of that, to penetrate. So, We all know that this story is about the sower sowing seeds, and I love the way he's generous. This isn't a sower that walks along and thinks, well, that looks pretty fertile. Oops, drop a few there. That's not so good. Rocks. That I'll drop. No, this sower just splashed it everywhere. (laughs) He just, and at first you think, what, was he a clever farmer just to be wasting seeds where he thought it wouldn't grow, it couldn't grow? But that's the Father's heart. He loves you. He loves you. And you might look as if you are the hard soil, but he knows your heart. So he's just putting the seeds there. He's putting them everywhere. He's just abundantly flinging seeds because this is the message of life. This is the message of life. The hard soil. Let's look at the different soils. It's all the heart response to that seed. Many of us have had times in our lives where we have been like that hard soil. Maybe that's where you are at this moment. And if you're watching online or on Catch Up, I just want to welcome you specially and say, this is a message that I really pray will penetrate into your hearts. Hard soil, why is that? Many times it's hardened just because we've had to toughen up in order to cope. Things have been so hard. We've suffered so many disappointments. Maybe there's been abuse. Maybe there's been a lack of of understanding. Maybe there's just been an appalling set of circumstances. And you think, why is this all happening to me? And in order to cope, you've become very hard. I understand that, and Jesus understood that. That's why he mentioned that first, because he said, so often when you're like that, I'm still throwing the seed. I'm still reaching out to you because I love you. I want you to change. But if you don't open and make yourself available to that message of life, it's going to be snatched away hard hearts. We understand why, but I pray if that's you, just allow what we were singing about, the drenching of the Holy Spirit to soften you. 
there's the shallow heart, the heart that has so many rocks and stones and things that have happened again that they're little pockets of soil and maybe there's a little bit of a growth taking place. But when the sun comes up or when there's persecution, that withers and dies because you tried it, but it just doesn't work. Not for me. Oh, I urge you, if that's you, change. Open your heart. Listen seriously. It doesn't have to be that way that you struggle for the rest of your life with these rocks and these stones. That's what Jesus wants to come take away. The third is the thorny heart, the crowded heart, because you receive that word, you want to believe it, you want to get going, but then life happens. There's just so many worries, there's so many anxieties, there's so many problems and pressures, and you know, where will you get the money to pay the bills? And there's all of this interesting stuff that other people are doing that you'd rather like to go along with. And the thorns and the weeds just crowd out the growth and it withers and dies. And then there's the fruitful soil, the soil where it actually does take root and start to grow. And the little roots become fruits because they first become roots and shoots and fruits. And there is fruit. But if you look at what Jesus said, it's so interesting. It's not, and then there's fruit. He was so wise. Some are 30%, some are 60%, and some are 100%. Some are just less than half the potential of what they could be. Some have just squeaked over the 50 to get to 60. You're still not the capacity of what you have created for abundance. And then there are those who are the 100 percenters. We just rejoice in those that they are bearing fruit. That's the parable of the sower. Let's go quickly to verse 13. Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? Because the disciples were asking him to explain. How then will you understand any parable? Verse 14 is key. The farmer sows the word. And in Greek, that is the Logos. Remember that. The Logos. That's what Jesus says. This is powerful. The farmer is sowing the word. The Logos. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes it away. Interesting here. We've been talking about the enemy in this restore course. But how amazing that Jesus actually calls him by name. We have an enemy. We are in a battlefield. And where you are responding to the things of God, you can be sure that Satan, the enemy, will try to snatch that away. So it's vitally important that we are in fellowship with other believers who can pray with us, hold us up, be strong with us, listen to worship music, grow in the things of God. All the tools which we would love to help you with. You don't have to be alone and battling any longer. Others like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word at once, receive it with joy, but they have no root. They last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall. The deceitfulness of the wealth, the desires of other things come and choke it. That's the weeds. So the worries of this life. So we have the seed sown on hard ground, rocky ground, amongst the thorns, and then the good soil. And Jesus explains all of this so carefully because he really wants us to get this message. But I want to just look for a moment at the word, what was sown. Because we've talked about the soil. We've talked about the heart response. I'm now wanting to just focus on that seed, the Logos. Before I talk about the Logos and the impact of the word, the 
question that I said I was going to ask you at the beginning is still simmering. Part of it is for you to think about what kind of soil you are. You are one of these. If you're feeling that you have had so many disappointments and hurts and pains along the way that you have become hardened, or maybe there are just so many rocks and stones in your situation that nobody will understand, I want to encourage you by saying, Jesus knew exactly. You are here this morning and you are listening online for a reason. It's not an accident because he has a beautiful purpose for you, a purpose of abundance, a purpose of freedom, a person of enjoying his presence. The seed is the Logos. As I said, John, in his gospel, didn't give any parables. But John's gospel starts by saying, in the beginning was the word, the Logos, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then in verse 14, it says, we beheld his glory. He took flesh and blood and came and lived amongst us. And John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. Just what I was saying about the birds, Satan coming. Again, but Jesus said, I have come that you would have life in abundance. There it is again, abundance. It's the same sower message that John is giving chapter after chapter after chapter. And this is the essence of this parable, and this is why it's so vital we understand. The seed, remember what I said at the beginning? Everything that's wrapped up in that, it's a capsule of the DNA of that master perfect plant. The taste, the texture, the color, the energy is encapsulated in the seed. <laughs> and Jesus said, the so is so is the seed, which is the logos. I am the word made flesh. Open your hearts. You might think it's dry, crusty soil. It might be rocky soil. I can deal with that. The response I asked you, open your heart. Let the Logos, the living Jesus, come and dwell with you. That's John chapter 15. He starts with the Logos, which is all about this parable, the word, the seed. And right at the end, before Jesus went to the cross, when he had his closest people with him, the discourse was this, abide in me, let me live in you, the implanting of this living word, Jesus in our hearts, changes everything, and he through parables was trying to wake up people, provoke them to see this is the truth about the kingdom of God. It's glorious, it's wonderful, it's worth rejoicing over. Like the last coin and the rejoicing and all these other parables. The good Samaritan who came alongside and who cleaned up that man who was attacked and nurtured him and put oil on his wounds and put him in the hostelry and paid. All of this, when you understand this parable of who Jesus is and what he's doing in your life when you're open to him, Everything makes sense. Isn't it wonderful? It's beautiful the way the Lord's just unpacked and orchestrated this. The abundant life is in the seed. It's not in the soil. So no amount of striving on our part. No amount of doing good exercise. I mean, all of that's really good. We need to keep fit and do stuff. But you get all of these self-help courses saying it depends on you. It's all up to you. And we are saying, no. We're saying, Lord, I've made a real mess. I've become hard. I've allowed the rocks to just trip me up over and over. I've allowed the thorns to entangle me and just catch me. But I'm coming to you and releasing all of this. 
and asking that you will fill me with yourself like a seed. And how amazing when that seed, which is Jesus Christ, the designer of this fantastic glittering cosmos, <laughs> the perfecter and author, indwells us. What a difference it makes to life, doesn't it? I think it's exciting. <laughs> it really is. It's not just a tomato pip. It's Jesus Christ, the Logos, the Word, made flesh. <laughs> we can receive him, and the capacity is unending of what he can do through us. That's why he says all things are possible to those who believe, and it's true. Who would think all the things that he's done through your life, through my life, through people here, the testimonies, shifts of hopeless, hopeless situations. But we haven't given up because we're clinging to that hope. Oh, there's so much more I could share, but the time is marching on. But if you can get this, the sower will never be the same for you again because he's sowing the word. And Jesus knew exactly that. And John, who was listening to this, possibly was penning how he would write his gospel. The word, the seed made flesh, dwelt among us, we saw his glory. So then you understand all these scriptures as you start to read them. Christ in you the hope of glory. May the word of God dwell richly in you through Jesus Christ. There's so many of you. I think of James 1.21. James is such a practical little book. But he says, put aside all the filthy stuff and clutter, for goodness sake, and in meekness, seek the implanted seed, the word, in your hearts. That's what James says. So all through scripture, these themes just recur over and over. And the book of Hebrews is one that we don't even know who wrote it. It could have been Lydia. It could have been a woman. We just don't know. But it's so interesting. The book of Hebrews is beautifully written, but I'm going to just go very quickly from the version that I love, this amplified classic version. Hebrews 12 one and two, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance. This is the nitty gritty of how to. Let's make a decision today to do that. It's an unnecessary weight and it's a sin which so readily, deftly and cleverly clings to us, entangles us, and let's run with patient endurance and steady perseverance the race before us. And then verse two, looking away from all that distracts. And this is again the parable don't let distractions come. Don't be entangled, but just get rid of it now. Let's do that, and let's go for all that God has got for us in his abundance. And then Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, whew, this is a heavy one. Let your character or moral disposition be free from love of money, and that is this obsession with gimme, gimme. My name is Jimmy. Not quite, but... <laughs> Um, the love of money, including greed, avarice, lust, craving, all the earthly possessions. We know all of this stuff. Be satisfied with your present circumstances because Christ infills you and indwells you. And I have included this because I really believe there might be somebody here today who are feeling alone and feeling nobody has really understood. And if I knew your name, I would just say it. But I believe this is what God is saying to you. For he, God himself, has said, I will not in any way fail you or give you up or leave you without support. I will not. I will not. He says it again. I will not in any degree leave you helpless or forsake you or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Oh, I pray you get that message. That's a strong one. And therefore, 
And the next verse six, don't be seized by alarm. These are all the things that stop the flourish. Just give it to me. With the band coming, please. And I know it's just Mark. So we've looked at the soil, the response of your heart. We've looked at this amazing seed. And then as we close, what's extraordinary is as we've received this message and we know Jesus for ourselves, we've given him all of the mistakes and the mess, and we've received the newness of life. What happens is extraordinary. We become sowers. We get to fling that seed. We become the sowers. What you sow, you grow. What you sow, you grow. If you're sowing love into your children, into your family, in spite of circumstances, maybe you're getting a whole lot of negative stuff back, but if you sow love, you grow love. If you sow joy, you grow joy. So I encourage you as we close, let's just pray. Father God, what a joy <laughs> to share the sower, the essence of who you are, <laughs> the magnificence of the capacity of all your characteristics, the energy of creativity, of life in abundance. And we can have you indwelling us. <laughs> oh, Father, I pray. If there's somebody here who doesn't know you, may today be the day where they just ask you to come in, to penetrate whatever hard crust, whatever stony, rocky base, whatever thorn, tangled mess. Come in. <laughs> oh, come in and fill us with the newness of life as we yield ourselves fully to you. God of abundance, <laughs> God of glory, thank you that you've made all of this available to us through Jesus.